Welcome to the Time Talks podcast, part of the Channel Zero Network. I'm Chris Time Steele, and this marks the one year anniversary of the show. I'm grateful for the show's growth, for the people who have shared it and given me feedback. If you can, please support the Patreon at patreon.com slash time talks. Big thanks to Awareness for the music as always. For the one year anniversary of the show, I'm happy to share this conversation with the philosopher, intellectual, professor, and revolutionary freedom fighter, Dr. Joy James. I've been reading Joy James for years from working on articles on surveillance and incarceration. James is an Ebenezer Fitch professor of the humanities at Williams College and has a PhD in political philosophy from Fordham and a postdoc MA in systematic theology from Union Theological Center. Seminary, where she studied with Cornell West and the late James Cone, rest in peace. She taught at CU Boulder for many years and now teaches at, in Massachusetts. She specializes in political theory, critical race theory, and feminist theory. Her most recent book is Seeking the Beloved Community, a Feminist Race Reader. Her other books include Resisting State Violence, Radicalism, Gender, and Race in U.S. Culture, Shadowboxing Representations of Black Feminist Politics, Transcending the Talented Tenth, Imprisoned Intellectuals, America's Political Prisoners Right on Life, Liberation, and Rebellion, The New Abolitionists, Neo-Slave Narratives and Contemporary Prison Writings, Warfare in the American Homeland, Policing and Prison in a Penal Democracy, Spirit, Space, and Survival, African American Women and White Academe. She edited the Angela White Davis Reader and is co-editor of the online 2016 Abolition Collection Elections Blog. In this interview, Joy James spoke about the Academy, the concept of the captive maternal, the Central Park Five trial, prison abolition, and simulacra. We talked about her recent essay, The Womb of Western Theory, Trauma, Time, Theft, and the Captive Maternal, which is linked on the podcast page, so I highly recommend reading. Thanks once again for tuning in. The interview will begin after a short clip from another podcast in the Channel Zero Network. In this story, when you hear this, turn the page. Let's begin now. I guess I'll, I'll just start here. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak about your te- of teaching counter narratives, how you approach combating propaganda, and as you mentioned before, the liberals don't like talking about violence, and so often the academy will speak about how groups were repressed instead of also speaking about agency, such yeah. as the legacy of slave revolts leading to actually abolition, uh, you know, supposed abolition until you get the 13th Amendment, mm-hmm. or academia not holding up Africana history, but holding Greek philosophy as a pillar of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the university is an interesting site, right? So for those who are of us who are employed within it, and who are also progressive, and our progressivism tends towards radical, right, um, with suggestions of revolutionary struggle, which we largely do not wage and cannot wage within the university. But for those within that cadre or collective, you know, we find the endeavor sometimes depressing, always challenging. And they're also minor victories. So for the question of violence, right, you can study the issue of violence as a concept and it appears, in my perspective, you're permitted to do so if it's quite abstract, right? If you concretize it to contemporary violence or the ways in which deprivation and disenfranchisement is tied to a long legacy of violence, and it be, it's perceived as controversial. You know, it's like, it's something as if you're advocating. For example, when I was at Brown and I was uh, hired as a full prof and provided with $10,000 for research, which most people assume do individual research and they produce new publications or 
whatever they choose to do with that kind of research um, funding. So I decided to do a conference on political imprisonment. It was also at the time in which uh, George W. Bush was preparing for his so-called shock and awe invasion of Iraq under false pretenses of weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. being um, um, created there by Saddam Hussein. So in doing this endeavor, I found all kinds of obstacles and opposition, some subtle, some not so subtle. The fact that the political prisoners themselves, and this was not just people who had been incarcerated because they had fought for the Black Liberation Movement or the Emancipation, Second or Third Emancipation, I don't know how many we need here, you know, white supremacist democracy of, you know, people of African descent, but it's also people who had struggled for Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico independentistas, white anti-racists who have been in the anti-apartheid uh, movements, people who could represent AIM, the American Indian movement. So the fact that the state had used repressive violence against organizations that originally did not seek militaristic means, you know, to remedy or to protect themselves against state violence. That was a discourse that appeared to be not just novel to the university, but also controversial and a discourse that needed to be reprimanded and censored, if not completely shut down. So. And doing this conference that led to the anthologies, Imprisoned Intellectuals, The New Abolitionists, and later Warfare in the American Homeland, I found that if you treated the history of liberation movements not as an abstraction, but as a living testimony to the will and desire of people to be freed from repression, but also to not succumb to state terror, and that would include, you know, quote Malcolm, by any means necessary, that in fact was a taboo. So when I'm called into the president's office, I'm told that I can teach anything but advocate nothing, meaning don't advocate anything. And obviously, I'm not advocating any particular kind of day-to-day um, -day struggle because people in their communities figure out their day-to-day -day struggles organically on the ground. But as a theorist and an academic, I am pointing to the tangible material conditions under which a racist capitalist democracy reproduces itself, right, through caging or terrorizing populations that it feels it needs to corral or disappear. That pointing to that not just as something we mourn, but to that as actually realities that have been consistently fought through various means, that that was the prohibition. And for me, it was not a prohibition against advocacy, even though it was couched in those terms. It was a prohibition against critical thinking. Yeah, and you're, the, the theory that you produce, I had always found it very uh, easy to grasp, and it also had a historical context. And the seeds that that produces is something you never know where that can go or how that will influence people as well. Yeah. And that's one of the most important things about theory. But I also think that's the scariest thing about theory mm -hmm. is that you, like, if people start thinking critically, you have no idea what they will produce. Amazing art, amazing culture, amazing resistance movement. Right. I mean, this is for me, the thing about critical theory, and this is not, you know, I'm not talking merely about textual theory that you find one of the architects of Western theory or European theory or you can move around the globe. Right. That you find one of the archa uh, architects and then you become a specialist or scholar in their way of thinking. And you, so you reproduce the norm tied to a particular kind of genealogy of thought. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, that scholarship, of course. I'm talking about the kind of scholarship that you can't put in the box because what it starts to reproduce is something that you've never seen before. 
And that, and this seems like an anomaly or contradiction of the university, right? That the university is supposed to seek, the university is supposed to seek the most innovative, transformative means of thought and creation of critical thinking in order to create new knowledge or epistemologies, right? Mm -hmm. That's more like the marketing for it. Yeah. The university probably is, to, in, under capitalism, under racial capital, right, reproduce the norm but expand its base and to accumulate. So you end up probably at times with the accumulation of other people's cultures, cultures other people's thinking as artifacts, right, in some kind of museum, and that actually becomes one of the vulnerabilities of our movements. It's, it's what um, some scholars have called the museum effect. You know, mm -hmm. that they happened years ago, decades ago. They're artifacts of the past, right? Um, they were infantile in some ways because they didn't have a pragmatic base. And that completely misses the reality that they were grounded into the needs of the communities within which they were embedded. The university is not grounded into the needs of any community in struggle. Mm -hmm. If it's a state university, it is technically and legally a government entity. If it is a private university, it is a corporation. So whether it's state capital or private capital, which, you know, they've always been married in various ways or converged in, you know, private corporations have dictated policies for the state, the state has police and protected private capital. That is not theory. That is architecture. That is engineering. But that is not the unexpected, quirky inevitability of new thinking for freedom. It does not come from those sites. It comes from communities in struggle. Obviously, you know, new theories about genes and about black holes. I mean, all the, you know, the technical science using the wealth of the state and the, and the corporation creates these moments, right? But those are moments of, of technology, of medicine, of engineering, which are impressive, but they don't necessarily deliver freedom or equity to people. I mean, people have to deliver that to themselves, and that is not the university's role to democratize and amplify culture through political struggle. It should be up to the self-determination of those, of whatever communities that decide to do whatever forms of liberation they're seeking. Yeah, but also I don't I want to be, I mean, I could be relativist and say, like, whatever you do is fine. And I know that's the narrative. Everybody do something. However, back to the issue of violence. Some people believe that you can reform the state so that it actually will quell the levels of violence against disenfranchised peoples and communities, indigenous people, black people, Puerto Ricanos, Puerto Ricanos people coming across the border, actually into territories that the U.S. technically stole um, from the nation south of, of the current U.S. border, right, through the Treaty of Guadalupe or whatever, mm -hmm. that those people, right, a 20-year-old Guatemalan woman shot in the head, a 20-year-old woman with uh, two infants and a toddler found dead in the desert, those people live terror, not because they're inflicted it on themselves. I mean, all communities have violence they're dealing with, but they they understand terror delivered and organized through the state. Those communities are the ones who face that reality, and those communities are likely the ones who have the experiential knowledge to address that. So if you're looking for purely legalistic reform or reform through electoral politics, as important as those endeavors are, if they do not 
directly confront the violence from the state apparatus and its ability to inflict harm on all people, all ages, all genders, ungendered, then we we're we haven't addressed the full capacity of our thought and we haven't addressed the full capacity of our will to be free of terror. That actually technically as taxpayers we're paying for. Yeah. No, that's that's one hundred percent. I agree. And and now on this this topic you're talking about, I think this really ties into your powerful essay, The Womb of Western Theory, Trauma, Time Theft, and the Captive Maternal. And you write that the captive maternals are those most vulnerable to violence, war, poverty, police, and captivity, those whose very existence enables the possessive empire that claims and dispossesses them. And you speak about how Western democracy that's based in American exceptionalism emerged enlightenment ideologies to create this white supremacist background that you say, quote, fed on black frames, and you call it an anti-soulmate of freedom. And can you talk about how the you write the absent dialectic between master and captive maternal is a missed opportunity for the evolution of revolutionary theory? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. You just said a lot. <laughs> It was, it was mostly <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember everything I say sometimes. And also, when I'm writing, I'm in that zone. Yeah. It's, it's just others are talking to me. They're like, what about this? Put that one in there. Um, I totally abide by this notion of, it's not just a notion, the fact of collective theory, or as Barbara Christian would say, theorizing as a verb. Mm. And also the collective wisdom of the material world and the immaterial world, right? Of the spiritual and of the people, the spirituality of people, the spirituality of our ancestors. Um, You have conversations all the time, not always with fully physically embodied people. The captive maternal, uh, as a concept, came about after um, I started dealing with this with the state and looking at its treatment of children in its system. And also, you know, dealing, you know, means multiple things. So it wasn't purely research, you know. Mm -hmm. And meeting mothers and watching them closely, it always meant mothers from organizing, because mostly I just organize with women, not on these high-profile Um, levels of platforms, right? So the academic profile is higher than the activist profile, but the activist profile is what I adore. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not a profile per se, it's a practice, right, of humility and also, uh, to the best I can muster, courage. So to give you the long, short version of it, and when I was organizing with um, black women from Edgar Evers College, and I wasn't in their formation. I was in another political formation, a multiracial women's group that had ties with the Communist Party. I saw the way in which they critiqued the world, and their critique was dismissed because they were read as working-class black mothers from a non-elite institution of higher ed, and so how could they have this kind of critical savvy? But they're the ones who predicted the fall of the of the wall in 89, right, and the rapprochement between and at least, well, you could joke about Putin and Trump right now, but anyway, yeah. between um, Eastern Europe and, and Western Europe, right, that it would be capital and it would be people of color who would still be left out in cold and still be treated as detritus or raw resources, not just their minerals per se, but the people themselves and their labor and cultures. And they offered that first critique um, that that actually influenced my critique of Foucault, which I first wrote about, or published in 96, but I, in a graduate class um, where I took a postdoc with Angela Davis at UC Santa Cruz, we were reading Foucault's Discipline and Punish, and I gave a closing talk to being a Ford Fellow. My critique of Foucault, which Davis 
later, um, you know, used in some part to issue her own critique, I think a couple of years later, then other critiques have followed, right? Mm -hmm. It was from the framework of black maternal activism because they cared for the children, they cared for the communities, they cared for the elder. And it, it, yes, electoral politics were important, but so was the day-to-day -day reality of making sure your kids had enough food, had necessary and quality or the best you could get quality medical care, got to school when they were supposed to be at school, had safe school environments, didn't get harassed, imprisoned, or shot by the cops, right? It was that way that I saw that their captivity was not just from the oppression or the repression of the state. It was also this entanglement and love for their families and their communities. And not just their biological cold children, right, or their particular grandmothers or grandfathers or grand aunts, grand uncles, um, great aunts, great uncles. It was it was really broadly sketched. I mean, it was this huge embrace, right? Mm -hmm. And so what kept you disciplined was not just the state's animus against you, which you were happy to return, but what kept you disciplined was in a loveless state, your capacity to love the most vulnerable. And that meant that the way you were positioned in struggle it radiated beyond any kind of linear or unitary animus. And this is also where I felt like intersecting those um, aggressions didn't work, you know, in itself because you can add more like, oh, it's because I'm black or because I'm female, because I'm queer, because I'm undocumented, right? You could do an additive approach, but that still could not deal with the multidimensional reality of people who literally kept communities alive. And and keeping them alive wasn't just about physical issues or medical issues or not being brutalized in the street or in the home. Keeping them alive was also about intellectual and spiritual issues. And when I started to um, really watch closely, and I was saying in 96, right before I got very much involved with, you know, trying to figure out what is our relationship with children and our relationships are always flawed because, you know, we, you know, we didn't grow up in pristine environments, right? And, and we're complicated with contradictions and we fail all the time, but we keep trying. It was then that the, the idea that captive maternal started to gel. And so first I was writing a piece about six years ago called Afro-Realism and the Black Maternal or the Captive Maternal. And it was like an acknowledgement of how much Afro-pessimism as a school of thought had contributed to critical thinking, particularly in its willingness to deal with violence, not as an abstraction or some kind of museum effect, right, or, or artifact. But I was also trying to find out where the feminized persona who was nurturing and reproducing the social world with the knowledge that it was going to be used as raw resource to be exploited, right? Keeping everybody alive so then they could become edible Negroes or Negresses, or they could be consumed by the state or tossed away by the state. Um, I was trying to figure out what are the dynamics at play here, and can we track our struggles, not just by recovering heroic women, and by the way, you know, the captive maternal I see is an ungendered phenomenon, right, or persona. So I would say, like, Asada Shakur was kept alive when she was run away, you know, as a young teen because she was taken under wing by another kind of maternal. It wasn't her biological mother, right, because she left home. And it wasn't necessarily her aunt, Evelyn Williams, who defended her admirably at trial later. Um, after she'd been um, captured and tortured by, uh, you know, the FBI, COINTELPRO, and the state, um, it was, you know, it was a trans um, woman, right, who who took her in and kind of rescued her and nurtured her and mentored her, so that she could actually grow up, you know, past the age of 21. 
and just trying to figure out these moving dynamics. I, I so it went back to history to Elizabeth Key in the 1600s, you know, brought forward to Asada, how the captive maternal is not purely a subjugated female in the household or the workplace, but is actually a nurturer who can have varied ideological, you know, expressions. I mean, range from conservative to liberal to radical to revolutionary, but is central to the reproduction of the world. That without this form of caretaking, without this form of sacrifice, without this kind of glue to the social order, which is tied to the economic order and the political order and, you know, just the very notion of what is familial and familiar in the world, that things do not function. Obviously, my version of a captive maternal that I find the most intriguing would be the ones who embrace revolutionary politics. What I hope, you know, as I continue to explore this, since I've written about the captive maternal in these various aspects, just trying to figure out what is this concept as reality that is haunting me, right? So um, in an essay called um, Killmonger's Captive Maternal is MIA, I explore the Hollywood blockbuster Black Panther Mm -hmm. and why is it that the one persona who seems like he was actually somebody who could have been in a black revolutionary movement in the States and who has all the contradictions of a dispossessed person who is not an imagined black royalty, right, in some pristine environment, how the absence of their mother in that narrative is a huge hole. It's a vacuum. And, And it's so like the absence becomes significant in real ways. And so I'm... I'm thinking, right, of the captive maternal, and that is an intersectionality um, persona, because with the captive maternal comes ideology. And intersectionality, you have this intersection, but you don't ask once you hit the corner or at the intersection. Are we talking about liberal intersectionality, radical intersectionality, neo-radical intersectionality? I'm very much interested in the function, not the identity marker with the captive maternal. I think it's that function as a form of activism, as a form of labor, um, sometimes forced and coerced, often given voluntarily to the point of exhaustion and despair at some, you know, juncture. But that is an under-analyzed reality in our struggles. But that may be, like, actually a key foundation or platform to taking our struggles to another level. Yeah, and you've you've written before saying the, the majority of social change agents continue to be women working in triple shifts for depressed wages, unpaid child rearing and housework, and volunteer community building, black women's pivotal role struggles that go undocumented and unnoticed, which I thought that tied right into this essay and what you're speaking on now. Yeah, it, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just saying that I, I feel that this really connects to the uh, Central Park Five trial on what That's you have what spoken I was about. Go to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go yeah. Ahead. So yeah, in '89 I had gone to the trial um, because I belonged to a women's dojo. It was this interesting dojo in Park Slope in Brooklyn, where the white woman who headed it, it was all women's dojo, right? to the best of my memory, had been trained by someone who had been in a Black Panther party in Harlem. So after we practice one day, she tells us about this trial, which we already know is looming because it's haunting the city, right? And it comes after the death, around the time a little bit after the death of Yusuf Hawkins. Um, It's the only anti-apartheid movement and the fights against police brutality, and so it becomes a lightning rod, not just because of the, of, of the rape and the attack against Trisha Mealy, right? It becomes a lightning rod because, in a way, the city needs a white victim in order to exonerate it for its white supremacist violence against blacks and um, brown or Latino, you know, Puerto Rican, you know, Dominican people, right? So, you know, after we finish one of our trainings in the dojo, you know, 
we were asked to consider going to the trial. And only one person testified at trial, and you can't really get the sense from the very interesting um, film that Ava DuVernay did. I mean, just really emotionally rich. And before that, there was Ken Burns' film, The Central Park Five. And so Ava DuVernay follows a number of years later when we when they see us, but really brings a resonance of black culture and perspective that isn't present in the documentary, maybe because it's a documentary or maybe because of the stories of black communities and black families are not gone into that deeply. But when we go to the trial, and Yusuf, again, is the only one to testify. He's the only one who did not do a, a confession, you know, a taped confession. Yeah. I was, Sharon had stopped him, right? She had stopped him, but there's also um, Sharon Salam, his mother, in the film, right, she interrupts this. Mm-hmm. And she represents this incredible, powerful persona of the captive maternal. So you're right. So before I even started organizing around in Texas and, other, and in New York City around what happens to our children in the system, I saw what happens to our children in the system. You know, when I was a young person myself and, you know, training in a dojo, go with about six or seven other women, and we're multiracial, we're we're black, we're Latinx, we're um, white. We stand for over an hour to get inside. I remember that because there are very few seats for the public. Most of the seats are for the press. The New York Times and the major papers had already um shape the narrative, and that was one of guilt. And a little bit of that comes out in when they see us, but not not really how, how vicious, you know, the liberal media was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I watched, I watched as he defended himself, and then I watched the jury basically ignore him, like yawn, some people read the newspapers, which I didn't know you're supposed to do that if you're in the jury box. Yeah. Um, but it was sort of like, we already know you guys are guilty. You, we're just here because we, you know, we answered the, the call. We got called up for this. And when is this going to be over, right? Um, that was my sense. Um, so when I walked out, I followed up by going to other organizing events. Um, one, Suzanne Roth, um, a white radical woman who actually used Angela Davis's article, The Myth of a Black Rapist. There was a form at um, 1199, which is the labor union, right, which was very supportive of Martin Luther King Jr., predominantly black, and they had held a forum. I had gone with a friend of mine who was white. We were in seminary. We'd been in seminary together at Union. I watched again how the press this time, a writer from The Village Voice, completely mischaracterized that gathering. There was one or two negative voices about the survivor of the attack, Trisha Mealy, but most of it was this sort of critical analysis. What is this rush to judgment? What does a legal lynching look like? What is the history of um, accusations of rape against black men that focus only on white women as victims? Because at that time, and I remember to this day, but we don't remember the names. Women and girls, and yes, men and boys too, but it wasn't registering that much as such, not in the numbers, but also not in the public narrative, were being sexually assaulted in New York City. There there was a woman of color who was thrown off a roof after she was raped, and she died. There were all these horrific sex crimes, however you want to characterize them. Violence against women, I was sure the violence against um, trans women, even though that we didn't have a public discourse for that then, mm-hmm. violence against children. But this is what made the news. And this was newsworthy, not just because she was white, but she also worked for a Wall Street for the Solomon Brothers, a high-level brokerage firm. So it was whiteness and capital. It was blondness. It was, it was everything within the category that Ida B. Wells wrote about. Mm-hmm. as being this iconic formation of white chivalry and white victimization that was facing an existential predator codified in, in blacks, right? Mm-hmm. And it was the mothers 
who I watched organize against that. Like in a movie, they show you Nomza and Alombe breath, right? And I I went up to meet Nomza and Alombe, and be, until I could meet them um, and get cleared by them, I couldn't meet Sharom, right? But once they gave me a green light, then I met Sharom at the Shambar. So I had been gathering knowledge. So when I went to this event at 11.99 and saw how the journalists from the Village Voice mischaracterized it as really another kind of crime against white females, which it was not. It was a serious endeavor to understand what was going on in that moment in which the city had a lynch mob mentality. And you see some of that in the film when the youth, when the young, um, they're not even men, they're boys, when they say everybody hates us. Mm. You, you, yeah. Well, when you see the placards, you see the support for them. You don't see in that film the hatred. And for those of us who were living in the city at the time, we not only saw it, it became a form of collective trauma, right? And so I ended up, when I read the piece in The Village Voice, which was written by a prominent white feminist, and I decided to write a response, like a letter to the editor. And I wrote it, I saw it with you know, my white friend who had been there with me at the event, but she was in a partnership with a black man. He was fearful. <laughs> the partnership with the Jamaican man. He was fearful. And so anyway, I ended up putting my name on it solo. Like, and I had to be on the phone. This is before I had cell phones, right? I didn't have one. But basically pay phones, talking to the editors of the Village Voice, they double. They made me verify. It's just a short little edit, letter to the editor. Double check, verify, jump through multiple hoops, right? That all the facts were correct. And then, to the best of my understanding, they later let the woman who wrote the slanderous piece against the gathering. I mean, she stopped writing for them. But it was it was this need to prove not only that we were innocent and to proving guilty, which was unprovable, actually. But it was this need to prove that we were malicious liars, that we could actually tell the truth about reality. And I was like, like, why, why does it, this is what, two paragraphs? And why is this taking days to be vetted? Because they couldn't understand. And this wasn't about the rape itself, mind you. This was just about a gathering at 1199. They could not understand that a multiracial group of men and women could come together and have a critique of racism and rape and denounce both simultaneously. And from there, you know, my first job was in women's studies. So I wrote another piece that was longer, and I was told that, you know, that could jeopardize my job because I was in women's studies, but it was still around the facts, and the facts were the case made no sense, which is when you when you see Duvernay's piece, it's so clear that the, the case made no sense. Mm -hmm. But we still had prominent black feminists and prominent black feminist men who were largely academics by the way, and this this goes back to my earlier critique of the academy. It's not exactly tied to the knowledge or the experience of communities that are most um, pol policed and under resourced. We still have them appear in print and and castigate um, the collective, but also the community as as protectors of rapists. And I'm I'm trained as a political scientist, which probably means nothing. <laughs> Politics. <laughs> have any material base and if there's any such thing as quote science and you would say like well if they got the location wrong if they had to bring one of the youth to the actual scene of the crime to quote put himself in it so he could get the details right if there's no dna if there's no but if there's no then how could you have this rush to judgment mm -hmm. and there was a segment of, of the black community that did not want to be associated with these youth because they represented all the stereotypes of black depravity. But then that meant they didn't want to be associated with the facts either. Because the facts would have told you 
that this was, if not exactly the Scottsboro case, because there had been a horrific assault. It was done by Matias Reyes, right, individually. Not the Scottsboro case per se, but this was another miscarriage of justice that could be seen as a collective legal lynching that would just be enforced by, you know, the juvenile prison and adult prison. And then if you, you know, I watched the four parts. I had to keep stopping at the last part in terms of the torture, um, the serial torture of of Corey Wise. Hmm. And there's, as they point out, there's no way you can monetarily compensate for torture, psychological, physical. There's no how many how big the check you want it to be. It's never it's never going to reconstitute the whole person. So it's not real compensation per se, right? It's just some kind of fee. Um, for, you know, it's not like sorry to bother you, but sorry, sorry to decorporalize you or, you know, or disembody you or something like that. But it's no real compensation. And so I'm in this curious moment, like looking at all these wonderful cats, the maternal is largely, you know, the mothers. And, and again, it's a non-gendered phenomenon and the fathers who are supportive and the pastors who are supportive and the community activists. Um but also realizing that our ire, our anger, our rage, which is righteous and just, doesn't seem to be focused on the state, Mm -hmm. right? Yes, if somebody's going to pay for this, so there'll be Letterer, who still has a job, Fairstein, who doesn't have a publisher, but they had, you know, 30 years of being, like, you know, these great white women protectors, um, through abusing, you know, black and Latino um, youth. But still, it feels like our demands are low and our memory is is curtailed. Like, we don't have a critique of how our own communities participated by not rebelling mm-hmm. in illegal lynch- lynching. I mean, it may sound really cut and dry, but if you don't rebel against a lynching, and risk something in that rebellion, then just tell me where in the line, where is the line between being neutral and complicit of? Because I can, I can't clearly see that line. And, you know, so that's my experience. That's my analysis of the captive maternal relationship to that case. I brought Sharon Salam to Hamilton College when I was a visiting scholar out there years ago, and she spoke on the case. I never could have created what DuVernay did, and I'm grateful for her gift. I would add to that that our political critique is going to have to become much sharper, more focused, and more embodied if we want to diminish these types of atrocities from reoccurring on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes into something else we were talking about, which was if you're going to speak about prison abolition, it needs to be coupled with discussions of anti-capitalism and how you can't have one without the other. Yeah, I so... I've been thinking about our movements lately, the last couple of years, about simulacra, right, which is kind of an imitation or would be like the fake version, like you have the real, you know, painting, the original ones from the artists, right, um, from Haiti or Senegal. And then you have the, the knockoff version, the faux version, the fake, right, which passes for the real and then you're supposed to appreciate the the beauty of the substitute as being a concrete expression of the real when it's just a knockoff, right? Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, I believe that celebrityhood has allowed imitations to supplant the real. 
And because capital, you know, our culture is a celebrity culture. I can't think of, and I'm sure there might be, I'm just not aware of it, any other culture right now that is so driven by celebrity, maybe because we don't have royalty, thank goodness for that, but then our celebrity become our royalty. And, you know, whether it's, I don't want to name any names, so we already know who our celebrities are, right? And so when there's no safeguard because there may not be a clear message about organizing in communities that are under-resourced with the leadership of those communities that are dominant, not the leaderships of authors or the leaderships of academics or the leaderships of prize-winning fill-in-the-blank, um, but the leadership of the people who live the day-to-day experiences and so have the epistemologies to unpack this and understand the intricacies or the complexities of engineering an alternative to it in a confrontation with the violence, right? However that confrontation can be, it can be pacifist and it can be non-pacifist. In the absence of that, then the most celebrated people or celebrities, you could call them whatever you want, might then become the leadership cadre. They don't live the conditions, but they become the advocates for the freedoms of those people who endure those conditions, right? Or sometimes they don't endure them or survive them. So you get this range of abolitionism, which now includes Kardashian West, Hmm. which you know, I've seen people like stop bashing. It's like fun. I'm not bashing. I'm just <laughs> noticing that the notion of an abolitionist is so open, right? That it includes POTUS 45 and includes his son in law, Jared Kushner, and mm-hmm. includes the Cope brothers, who, from my looking at Jane Muir's work, right, they wanted to reform penal codes because they wanted to do something about the prosecution of white collar costs. That's similar to the Cato Institute. Mm Mm-hmm. So somehow you have this bipartisan agreement where, you know, some conservatives who never seem to care about racial justice or black liberation or indigenous people controlling their own land and resources and not have pipelines, you know, destroying their what's left of, you know, it's all their land anyway, but what's left of it, right? Somehow everybody's in, uh, you, we have consensus on, on mass incarceration. And obviously since I've not been incarcerated, I am not going to criticize anything that gets people out. And I would include, I wouldn't criticize anything that got people out, and I'll just leave it at that, right? I'm not just saying, you know, the state's endeavor. Whatever it is that would free people from captivity should seriously be considered. Now, Mm -hmm. having said that, what what is abolitionism if it's not also a critique or a confrontation with racial capitalism? And what I, I'm not sure what we're abolishing here. If incarceration in the policing apparatus, imprisonment apparatus is derivative or derived, you know, it, it's based in racial capitalism, then what, what's, what's the plan? What's plan B, if that was plan B, for confronting racial capitalism? I don't see how you can sever the two. They're knotted together. They're knotted together, but if they are knotted together, then one of them may be the driving engine. And I don't believe mass incarceration is is the driving engine to the phenomenon of poverty, dispossession, over-policing, violent policing, incarceration detention centers. The driving engine would be racial capitalism, which would be the accumulation of people's mm-hmm. culture, their labor, their disposability, the gratuitous violence of being able to terrorize people because psychologically you feel 
because you have a badge and a gun or, you know, you belong to ICE and you have the letters on your jacket. You have a battering ram. You can knock in somebody's door. You can grab their two-year-old and throw them in a cage. I mean, the animus that permits this type of systematic violence exceeds the container of mass incarceration. Mm. And it exceeds the definitional norm, as far as I can think about it, of abolitionism. So when I was first introduced to abolitionism, of course, it was through Davis, right, because I had the postdoc there. Mm. Um, Davis asked me to do a prototype of critical resistance at CU Boulder, which was named after one of her lectures at UCLA in 69 or, 60, or 1969, 1970, and before she was um, let go and her contract was not renewed, which is a form of political repression because she was a member of the Communist Party. She's outspoken anti-racist. Mm. So we called it Unfinished Liberation. It was based on, again, one of her lectures that she gave on campus to, you know, hundreds if not thousands of supportive students. When we did it at CU Boulder um, in 98, that would have been March. Crit Resist, I believe, happened in September 98 in Berkeley. I saw a lot of the contradictions in the academy um, in terms of their love for celebrity, not a serious interest in abolitionism because they were organizers in Denver, but they didn't really have a key platform or presence because it was really mostly academics who were coming in. Even if they were graduate students, it was mostly academics who were coming in to talk and lecture about um, mass incarceration or prison abolitionism. I saw also the marginalization of, of radicals or revolutionaries who were tied to political prisoners or political imprisonment. So looking at that, um, Doing anthology states of the conf of confinement with Paul Graveman, Macmillan, which is a collection of the essays, mailing 50 copies inside prison, hearing from one of the intellectuals who had uh, been a member of the Black Panther Party who was doing long-term incarceration, receiving letters saying, "Well, this is nice, but it really doesn't reflect the conditions or the analyses of our conditions that we've been living like for decades, or whatever." That kind of sparked an approach to abolitionism that really needed to talk about the political beyond the conventional, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that analysis of abolitionism couldn't take the state as it is as the starting norm, like just accept the conditions of the state. You know, built on racial capitalism, electoral politics, which has a uh, High, you know, irregularities in terms of voter suppression historically against people of color, poor people, students progressive, et cetera, et cetera. Like disenfranchisement writ large all through the structures, a Supreme Court that could easily veer to the conservative or the ultra conservative. Like, and just accept that as the norm under which one pursues. Capitalism. So, under the, which the norm under which one pursued, um, sorry, I said capitalism, but I meant abolitionism, closing the doors here. So, there's the state that you deal with in the moment, it defines the terms and the rules of the game. If you play by those terms and rules, right, even if you have an imaginary vision of the future, it will likely not be concretized unless you actually have a program that challenges the state per se. Mm -hmm. Not just its expression through law in a particular area or arena that you're struggling with, but the very notion that a state built on racial capitalism will ever deliver concrete gains that benefit the masses of people. And I'm not saying you have to choose between one or the other, I'm just speculating, why can't you do both? Why can't you be pro-abolitionism and also state quite clearly that racial capitalism is not sustainable, it's not tenable? And I'm sure people will say, that's what we're doing already. And, and yes, I applaud that. But I'm also saying that there's some ways in which this celebrity 
template that's built into our culture has seemed to miss concrete examples of organizing that are outside of approved systems. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to the prototype we did that we did the prototype in the university, that it was the most expensive endeavor by CU Boulder at that time, right? That it cost tens of thousands of dollars. It meant that the university as a corporate state entity also shaped the agenda, even if that was not explicitly stated. There wasn't, there wasn't gonna be any talk or serious talk or discussion about going off script, meaning like thinking what struggle would look like beyond reform. There was going to be, there was going to be what it actually was, which was kind of academic, corporate, goodwill. We're going to organize and we're going to build an infrastructure, but it's the same infrastructure built by the state and nonprofit corporations. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't, funding it, so it kind of holds those margins. Yes, but it also, in some ways, shapes the aspirations. It tells you what is practical. Mm -hmm. And so then the virtue becomes a kind of pragmatism. And I'm not against being pragmatic. I mean, that's how we manage, you know, to pay your bills and not, you know, all, you know, those of us who can, you know, and that's not just because you're practical or pragmatic or better than anybody else, but... All of us function in a pragmatic world, if we're, you know, to the extent that we can. I'm talking more about who actually is calling the shots here. And I don't think polling a community where the very questions are not shaped by the community or the agenda, you know, it's almost like polling for the Democratic Party. And so to the extent... In a two-party system, it doesn't feel like most of our politics are shaped around one of the two parties. Obviously, the Democratic Party, it would be the progressive party of choice, and the struggle is to make it progressive, then, you know, figure out reform movements, electoral, and this is terrific. I mean, Tiffany Caban um, one in Queens is, you know, a prog probably one of the most progressive DAs in the city of New York with some 2.2 million people in her jurisdiction. This is amazing, you know, as I said before. And before that, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, I, I've gone to the DSA meetings and watched them do their their democratic processes, and they're very complex and they're very committed. Um, still have questions about where their analysis of race is beyond inclusion and diversity language, but impressive in terms of their willing to wrestle with democracy and make it actually become more democratic. Mm -hmm. The thing about people who are held captive, their needs are going to exceed the political process. And to meet those needs, Logically, one will end up in a confrontation with capital, with racial capital. Mm -hmm. And a confrontation is not the same as a critique. And so, again, in a celebrity culture, people can advocate for people to get out, and that is important the way Kardashian West did it. As she talks about it, she called Ivanka, said, I need to talk to your dad. She went to the White House. She made a joke with POTUS 45. Why did she throw Chloe off the apprentice? He laughed. She points to Alice Johnson, who she heard about, I believe, on Twitter. Like, she should not be in jail. Yes, she committed a crime, but she's trying to take care of her family um, in terms of, you know, working in the drug trade. And it was Kardashian West who calls the prison and speaks with the woman directly to say, um, you're going home. It's not the warden. It's not a state official. It is a incredibly influential and wealthy um, celebrity. And so when I look at that, I'm glad that 
she's out and back with her family. I listen with interest when both she and Kardashian West say that 45 is not racist. Mm-hmm. Right? So obviously the rest of us just misunderstood everything he said <laughs> and stands for. But, you know, and he's a compassionate person. I'm like, okay, that's logical given, like, what he was able to do. But then, for me, this is what sticks in mind. So a few people can do what a mass movement and struggle was penalized for attempting to do. Mm -hmm. Right? So if our own communities protect, right, against incarceration or try to get people out. The hurdles, um, the obstacles, the aggression from the police, the punitive response from the courts, right? That is predictable, right? And has a chilling effect. But for celebrities to lead and deliver us, right? From our quote perils and our bad choices, so to speak, without admitting that the state itself is the embodiment of predatory choice when it comes to the lives of poor people and black people, indigenous people, right? And working class people. Those become the contradictions that are not often addressed when we're celebrating these types of gains. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, this is what interests me about this struggle decades ago, right? When people were actually trying to end an empire and and free communities from a state, which means free communities from state violence, the amount of power you would have to amass to pull that off would be incredible. But the amount of consensus among all classes of people, including the celebrity class or caste, that would be absolutely indispensable. So in the last couple of months when I, you know, was reading a Kathleen Cleaver interview she did for PBS with Henry Louis Gates in 97, when she talks about the black bourgeoisie and she talks about this, this fake black united front, which people felt they needed to put out, right, put forward to the public, whereas Nixon had said black power is black capitalism, And the Panthers had said black power is really a form of communal socialism or communism, right? When we share the resources, it's not, you know, black people get to be capitalists too or get to be, you know, embrace celebrities like everybody else. That in that struggle, the people who prevailed were really the black bourgeoisie to the detriment of the black working class and the black poor. And you don't have to agree with the critique, but I just, um, I keep looking at it again, right? And I've talked about it in the past, like in the form of talking about the talented 10th, you know, and arguing about how Du Bois um, disavowed the concept, which he did not originate, the American Home Baptist Missionary Society did in the late um 1800s, but Du Bois popularized it in his work, The Souls of Black Folk. And for me to even focus on that, that was from, that was a suggestion of Charlene Mitchell, the woman who had recruited Angela Davis to the Che Lumumba section of the Communist Party in California. You know, I met her in New York City, and then I met her again through Davis, in California, and she was like, you know, go back to the Schomburg and and, and look at what Du Bois was saying, right? About when he was being persecuted by the state for his progressivism, that it was the working class, it was the trade union people who came out for him. It was not the black bourgeoisie. Hmm. And doing the book, uh, Transiting the Town to Tenth, right, was, was starting to look at that, but it hadn't it didn't progress that far because part of that book was all this celebratory. Let's think about black women in history. We're not talking about, you know, and then saying those names and putting them in print. And it was within this framework of conventional black feminism, just, you know, more progressive, like, you know, 
hopefully more progressive in some ways, right, by talking about the activism and, and highlighting Ida B. Wells and others. But, you know, 20-some-odd years later, more than 20 years later, actually, I don't, I don't think that we've progressed. I think in some ways, and I, I want to be honest here, I don't have a language for it. In some ways, we've become more imitative of the norm. Mm. I mean, culturally as performance, we're all, you know, we're always innovative and stuff like that. But in terms of political movements, I mean, we've become more embedded, at least the movements that rise to the top or even when they're not at the top, you know, Ford Foundation, whoever finds you and, 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 you know, shares the wealth and then helps to mentor you so that you start to look like all the other interventions that are mediated or channeled through nonprofit corporations or through the state itself. And increasingly, our analysis and memories of what it meant to fight, I'm not glorifying or romanticizing fighting that would be... Really, that's the best word I can say about that. Um, fighting is painful, and there are always losses, and it doesn't mean you'll win. And it doesn't mean there won't be repercussions for you, you know, being in opposition. But at least you see tangibly where the line is between complicity and opposition. Mm-hmm. And... I think those lines are so blurred now, and that everybody has the same rhetoric. Well, almost everybody. I mean, the white supremacists are coming up from underground. They're, they don't have that rhetoric of multiculturalism. But for those people who see themselves as within the middle bandwidth and on the progressive edge, the the, same, the language seems to be pretty clear. It seems to underanalyze violence. It seems to assume that you can actually control the state's ability to inflict violence on rebels through the state's mechanisms without having engineering your own kind of mechanisms. Yeah. I I mean, you really said it well yourself, and you you put down a a lot of things to think about. And when you're talking about drawing that line, when when people have fought back, uh, such as in Ferguson, black identity extremists came up as this term to continue COINTELPRO. Uh, there's been the death of Ferguson protesters, and yeah, that he talks about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you have these fusion centers, and the surveillance keeps growing, and then you're you're showing the juxtaposition with well, it's okay for celebrities to to do this, but when you organize or communities organize, it turns into extreme state repression. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I don't think people consider celebrities to be much of a threat, particularly if what they're saying is a reiteration of the norm. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's threatening is is what is a deviation. Yeah. And also, what's a surprise? When I I talk to my students about the wild card, like, what, you know, how did that happen? You know, whatever, you know, that was, you know, the original what got called Black Lives Matter. That was a surprise, right? But it was largely waged, is my understanding of it, they, you know, different folks in different places, and it didn't really have a hierarchical leadership. But that doesn't stop people from coming in and kind of, creating a semblance of order and then also creating these layers on top of layers of bureaucracy, you know, the fund for movements led by, you know, that these things that get, you know, formulated in book tours and, you know, movies, it's just, it's just so part of our culture of capitalist culture that even our movements become consumer items for us. Right. Mm-hmm. Having said that, though, people always struggle in different ways, but they're not going to be easily codified by the elites because the elites don't live in those communities of struggle. And what our demands are, there's so many, right? That's part of what's so beautiful 
Like if you go in, you go into these churches. So I, you know, I'm a church person, right? You go to these churches. Uh, you know, your pastor just came back from the border, or you you go to these churches that have memorials. You know, for murdered black trans women, like with these alabaster angels. So there's always contradictions, right? But there's these ways in which we remember the reality that we live with them and the fact that there is no rescue team coming for us. Mm. And with that kind of knowledge, that's a different operational base to recreate the world. Mm. It is not going to be a celebrity savior. Never was, never will. And if, you know, and if you're in a particular religious tradition that's thousands of years old, you know how the last one went out, right? It was, just, <laughs> it was always going to be bloody. It was always going to be hard. It was always going to be traumatic. But facing the reality of our lives has a beauty to it. Not our lives as they're broken apart and then written about and then sold back to us in academic discourse. But our lives that we understand because we continually fail ourselves and fail our communities and get up the next day to still be in community. The most important thing is showing up, not on the platform or the stage or screen. Mm -hmm. It's just like showing up and learning like how to live by the other people who are learning how to live and to reinvent ourselves like in this what's increasingly being turned into a wasteland. And so, I mean, for me, it's me, well, whatever. That's, that's a good life. You know, it's just being present to the struggle without trying to reduce the struggle into some kind of um, containable object and print or on screen or in a speech. Just to understand, all this is wild. Most of this is going to be violent, even if we're pacifists. The state is not a pacifist state. Any opposition or threat to it will be disciplined in some way. Celebrities might lose gigs. Other people can lose their lives. Mm -hmm. And so remembering, like, how, to the best that we can figure out, how the people who are incarcerated struggle. And the political prisoners such as Jalil Otakim and others, Leonard Peltier, who have done decades, moving into half a century, who need to be out. Yeah. And so whatever you say needs to honor the fact that there were revolutionary struggles that people died within, and then people disappeared into cages for decades. Because they fought. And because they fought, the state had to adapt. Because it had to adapt, you got some kind of modicum of um, resources, a respite, or accommodation, or assimilation. That never would have happened without a fight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the basic thing we can do, and this is why I keep going back to the political prisoners, is to incorporate ourselves within a community that incorporates them. Because that's where the fuller story and the narrative is. And so going as we started, or you brought in the very important work on the Central Park Five, it is not in the documentary. It is not in this emotionally rich film. The real narratives are always in the communities of struggle. And the captives are the ones who know the stories better than most. And the non-celebrity captives know the stories as they're written in the most grittiest form. And it's mm -hmm. that grit that is actually going to enlighten us. Thank you so much for speaking Thank to you. me. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye, Dr. Chief. You've just been listening to the Time Talks podcast. That was Dr. Joy James. Please support her work, buy her books. Please rate the show, share the show, tweet the show, gram the show, whatever the show. 
and check out the rest of the awesome shows on the Channel Zero Network. Thanks again to Awareness for the Music.